Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be standing in front of you. I've been doing research, uh, and I've worked at various firms. I started off at Kidder Peabody, then Solomon Brothers, then J.P. Morgan, and in just the last three years, started my own research business. Number one, we work for our clients. Um, we don't manage capital. We don't invest capital. We, you know, our clients own our business. But it's also built on trust. We do analysis, not opinions. So the presentation I'm going to give you really just provides some analytical framework, and, and you can form your own opinions about what that means. The formation of capital around crypto just hasn't followed past cycles. Cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin essentially needed zero dollars to start, so it didn't start with a venture capital or a private equity investment, uh, and it didn't go public to raise more money. And I think because it actually has gone under the radar, it's created a lot of controversy. This is very largely a millennial phenomenon. Um, so we have to keep in mind that the generation that is going to drive this asset as an asset class isn't really us and the people in the audience. It's really going to be our kids or those who are millennials today. And if you look at the, the five largest technology stocks in the S&P 500, they're essentially all native digital businesses. Digital trust is increasingly important. And as, as we move towards a decentralized world, you know, the question you have to ask is, does money have to be native in paper, or could we have a native digital currency? So we know that centralized systems aren't necessarily working well in a native digital world. The level of trust in the government is at the lowest levels in 50 years. So never has the average person more mistrusted the government. And again, monetary systems are very reliant on individuals trusting their government. So we're looking at countries like Brazil, Argentina, South Korea, Italy, Greece. Not surprisingly, these are the countries where digital currency development is flourishing. So there is a very high correlation between the lack of trust in their government and the, the blossoming of digital currencies. This is a Facebook survey done in 2016, and they asked millennials, uh, do you trust banks? 92% of millennials don't trust banks. Blockchain is creating digital scarcity and native digital trust. That trust doesn't exist in existing systems today. Millennials are someone born between 1981 and 2000, and that's roughly 96 million people that is the largest single generation ever in history. It dwarfs the baby boomers, which peaked at around 80 million. So what do the millennials experience today? It's companies like Facebook, Uber, Airbnb, Instagram, Kickstarter, things that we all use, and in fact, we all are very comfortable with. So clearly social media is a millennial story but here's some other things on that list, as you know, is blockchain is a millennial story. And I'll explain why I think that if millennials adopt this the way we think they are, this is not the internet bubble. This is a lot more like emerging markets becoming an asset class. I think that's really the appropriate analog. There's a lot of money being made in the crypto space. The biggest exchange for trading financial assets today is ICE, Inter, uh, Intercontinental Exchange. They, have, they own the NYC, NASDAQ, and they're global. Thousands and thousands of securities traded. They made a billion six dollars last year. We estimate Coinbase could make six hundred million dollars this year. It's a cryptocurrency exchange. Only has four currencies on it, and it's about three percent of global trading. In 18 months, Coinbase may be more profitable than ICE. And that is just mind blowing. I don't think anyone could believe that ICE, the biggest exchange in America, could make less money than Coinbase. And that may be the future. So one, there's a lot of money to be made. And, and Goldman, Morgan Stanley, even ICE understand this. And I think they're, grill, they're building infrastructure into gateways into crypto. The second is that the crypto market is already large. It's $500 billion today. It would rank as the 20th largest country. So again, I'm, if you think about the emerging markets analogy, crypto is already 
the same size as Brazil, Spain, Singapore, Russia. It's bigger than Ireland, Spain, Israel, Greece, Turkey, Vietnam. Crypto, Bitcoin and crypto are uncorrelated to other markets right now. It is uncorrelated. That is almost a holy grail for portfolio allocation. Bitcoin reduces your portfolio volatility, believe it or not. And the top chart, that blue one where it went stratospheric, is a 5% allocation. <laughs> so what we're saying is you don't need to bet your firm on crypto to see uncorrelated alpha. Bitcoin's rise in 2016 coincides with the first millennials entering their prime savings years. And just to give you some perspective, in the S&P today, 77% of the value of the S&P is intangible. It is not, if you liquidated the S&P today, you'd only get 20 cents on the dollar. The value of most major brands today is built on trust. Gold is one generation store value, but it's including collectible art, real estate, negative interest rate government bonds, and collectibles. That's a $280 trillion market is used today to basically park money, excluding financial assets. Bitcoin's $200 billion. If Bitcoin ends up just being 1% of the store of value in the future, it's 150,000 per coin. So again, from a mile away, I can see this value transfer towards Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Today, crypto, for every billion dollars that goes into crypto, it's turning into roughly $25 billion of price appreciation. If millennials put 10% of their savings flow, 100 billion, into crypto, that's a two and a half trillion dollar rise per year. And crypto is roughly a $500 trillion market cap. So we think that you may end up seeing Bitcoin by the end of the cycle as high as $10 million per Bitcoin.